of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, you may be seated. And if we had time, I would go around here and ask everyone why you were uh, willing to give up a big chunk of your Saturday to be with us. And uh, uh, I'm sure I get a lot of different answers. But um, for me, a lot of people are wondering what's wrong with the United States. How did we get into the situation that we're in right now? And I want to go, um, you, you can add your own things and now we got this uh, situation in the Ukraine and lots of uncertainty, um, lack of leadership, questionable leadership, what, where are they leading this exactly? Um, people's rights being trampled and things like that. So I hope by the end of this day you will be able to have a better insight into what's wrong and more importantly what we could do about it. How we got here and how we can move out of uh, some of the situations we're having. So I do have a goal for you and that's to be able to effectively promote Americanism and combat Marxism. So in order to do that you're going to have to know what they are and uh, characteristics of those so we're going to talk about that first. How do we define them? Uh, and what I want to do is give you uh, linguistic or verbal tools to be able to talk about this. A lot of people know that, you know, this is not making sense, this is wrong, but they really don't even know, well, where did this come from? Where, how did these ideas get here? And I want to give you a much better idea of that by the end of the day. So, um, I want you to be able to state a concise, accurate, useful definition for Americanism and Marxism. See, a lot of people say, oh, Mar Marxism, bad, 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 but they really don't know in a, in a con concrete way, well, what's the alternative? And, you know, and, and a lot of people, our young people especially, they're being raised to think that what are actually Marxist ideas are American ideas. They're not. So I want you to really clearly understand and uh, identify the difference. And then you can state three tenets of each one of these. Now, it's important to recognize, and I'll come back to this in a few minutes also, that there's no such thing as someone that's a pure Marxist or even purely into Americanism. We're all some kind of a, a blend and we're on a spectrum between these two uh, worldviews is what they are and we're all we all have a mixture because of our background and what's been taught to us so everybody's on somewhere on that spectrum um, and like I said we'll come back to that in part one in part two we're going to talk about well where did these two worldviews come from the intellectual and historical roots of each one and uh, your goal for that is to state three early sources for each world view. So when we're done all that, then we'll probably have our lunch break. And, and then when we come back, or we may reverse this, we may do this before lunch, we're going to talk about, well, how did this Marxism invade the United States? Because, see, it wasn't here before. America was based on, surprise, Americanism, and it's been invaded. And Marxism has invaded and we've allowed it to invade us. So we're going to talk a lot about that. And your goal in there is to state three tactics that the Marxists have used to infiltrate our society. And then you'll be able to recognize them as they continue to, to carry out their plan. And then part four, uh, this is important, uh, to strengthen Americanism and to combat Marxism on a national level. So that will be the national thing and your goal there will be explain three ways that you can contribute to the national effort to reduce Marxist influence in the USA. And, and also ways that you can promote Americanism. So um, and then we'll go to part five, that's the end of the day, how to strengthen them. Uh, Americanism and combat Marxism in our state in Vermont. So again three ways that you can contribute to the local efforts to reduce Marxist influence in Vermont. Okay so that's an overview what we're going to get done today. Does that sound worthwhile to people? 
Good. I mean, let's, what else could you do today that would be more useful than that? I mean, how many Saturdays have you devoted to this so far? Not that many, right? Okay. So now, I want to just end this intro with one thing. These are things to not say after this day. Everybody paying attention here? Ed said. <laughs> you know, that and $5 will get you a cup of coffee, right? That's not the point. I want to teach you to have your own arguments. This is what I believe. This is what I understand. And also to use scripture, the Bible, and reason, and other authorities. So I want you to be able to quote George Washington and John Adams and Abraham Lincoln and people like that. You can say, yeah, Abraham Lincoln said whatever it is. That, that will fly. But don't, don't quote me. I mean, that will be a total waste of time. Okay? I, I know you all agree with that. All right. Um, now, let's see here. How did I get to part two? I don't want part two. Okay, part five, part four. Let's see here. Uh, you know what? We're going to take a break. Get to know each other a little bit. I'm going to have to get a different... And I'm going to need that flash drive, Malachi. Somehow part one got left out of this. And... Or, or maybe... Sorry, I'm a little mixed up here. Let's go right to part two. So let's take a break. I apologize. So as Pastor Ed's doing that, I just want to take a second and introduce these two great Americans, Vermonters, and um, Miltontonian. This is uh, Nikki and, and uh, Brock. They are running for the school board. Um, in Milton. So if you know anybody in Milton, call them and, and vote for, for, for Brock and Nikki and Scott. Yep. Um, the three of them, they're working as a team and they're getting beat up very, very badly in the local press up there because they're standing up and they're conservative and they love God and they love children and they want to do the right things for families. It's about the parents of these two. These three really, for Scott as well. Anybody else uh, running for school board or select board or as a member today? Okay, great. Well, again, thanks for being here. Can you bring it here and I'll, I'll put this on it. We're not quite ready yet. Are you showing both screens? Okay, Malachi, you can get this back from me, and you're going to have to put this up. I apologize. I should have run through it. Okay, we're ready to start again with uh, part one. I apologize. I left it out of the big file that I gave to him. Okay, um, so we're gonna, now we're going to define and give the characteristics of both Americanism and Marxism. So this is really important stuff here. Um, so you want to be able to state a concise definition for each one of these and what are, what are and, and then three tenets of each one. And what is it? It's not just politics. It's not just the, the economy or economic theory. It's world views. It's, it's, it's a philosophy of life. It's, it's, it's 
questions like, is there a God, and if there is, what's he like? And who are we as human beings? Americanism has answers to these questions, and Marxism has their own answers, and they're different, okay? So you're not gonna find anyone 100% either way, like, like I mentioned, people are gonna fall somewhere on the spectrum between them. So here's a good example. Uh, Americanism says that not only does God exist, he's here. He, he is in charge of all of history and the universe. He, he made it and he's running it. And he's here, he's watching, he's judging, He's blessing, he's acting. He's part of, part of what's going on. That's a living God, okay? And the other end of the spectrum, Marxism says, there's no God, you don't need that. It's just, you know, it's just uh, the, the chemistry and the physics and the, the, the atoms and the, the, uh, the cells and things like that. They all made themselves and you don't need a God. Okay, you can't get more different than that. Well, a lot of people are somewhere, even on this one question, they're somewhere in between. Well, yeah, there's a God, but he's too busy to worry about what I'm doing. You know, that, so they're somewhere in between. They'll say, yeah, maybe he made, made the world, but then uh, he's not that involved with what's going on right now. We don't need to worry about that. Okay, that's a good example. And you can take any, any question like, what is a human being? And you're going to get very different answers from the Americanism side and the Marxism side. So that's what we're going to talk about, and we're talking about a, a worldview, a total philosophy, not just economics or political theory. So here goes your definition for Americanism. Here it is, the Judeo-Christian worldview on which the United States was founded. That's what you need to think about when you think about what is Americanism. It's the philosophy that the people who started the United States were operating on. It's where their ideas, where their plans, where the Constitution, all these things came from. So now let's talk about some characteristics of that. And then we'll go, and then we'll do the same thing for Marxism, we'll come back and compare them. But here's number one, ultimate reality. Ultimate reality is the kingdom of God temporarily being challenged by the kingdom of Satan. Okay? And this is reflected in a lot of our, you know, history. If you get down to Washington, D.C. and look at all the old monuments and things, you're going to see God everywhere. Um, and every piece of currency, every coin in the United States has an inscription on it. In God we trust. Now that's not a distant God. That's not a God that's not involved. We're trusting in him. Trusting him to do what? Trusting him to take care of us. Trusting him to judge, trusting him to protect what's good and, and fight against what's evil. So that's, that's, that's there. And here's a diagram now of actually the, the, everything that exists. God himself and everything comes from God. And when we come down to planet Earth, we see that there's this two kingdoms that in operation here. There's the loyal good uh, on the side of God where the, there's actually angels, uh, God himself, his spirit, and the characteristics are to entreat, to enlighten, to enliven, to empower, uh, a very active. And then on the other side is Satan and his kingdom to deceive, to attempt, to intimidate. And you're gonna see Satan's um, main mode of operation is to deceive and then to destroy. And Jesus said that many times and we see it. Uh, he's doing that. So in between is this battleground. Human cultural systems, social systems, individuals, the inner cell. So there's a battle within you between those two kingdoms. There's a battle on every level of society between those two kingdoms. Alright, so that's the ultimate reality from the Americanism side. Second, uh, morality. Morality is the Judeo-Christian biblical standards, including the Ten Commandments, equality of all people, marriage, and other institutions created by God. So it's biblical standards. And when we look at the roots of them, you're going to see this is what, it, what they were going back to, the people that started the United States. Where, where did their ideas of right and wrong, of law, come from? 
It came from God in his word. So, and the equality of people. You know, if you, if you don't have that, you don't have a basis for saying that everybody's equal. People that believe in evolution, like Darwin himself, said, no, there's, there's advanced people and then there's the people that haven't advanced. And we need to eliminate the ones that haven't advanced. We'll, we'll come to that. Uh, third, what is a healthy society? A healthy society consists of multiple institutions all under God. So, for example, the family, the church, enterprise, that's free enterprise, and government. And other major institutions should be independent of, governor, of, of, of government. See, a lot of people think that the difference between Americanism and Marxism is that, well, we believe in free, freedom of the individual, and they don't. That's really not, not a complete picture at all. <laughs> We believe in independent institutions functioning under God, independent of the government. So, for example, your family. Parental rights now are being trampled by the government because they do not recognize that the family is itself a sphere of human activity. Now, how many people have uh, ever gone through the Truth Project? Raise your hand. Right. Most people have not. That's something that would be very worthwhile because that's the Truth Project is like 13 uh, sessions and it's really uh, explaining this whole idea of multiple institutions all functioning under God and, and they each have their own role and government is just one of those. As we'll see in a minute, Marxism says, no, the only one that's important is government, and they tend to take over everything. You'll see, you'll see it in contrast in a minute. So remember, healthy society is multiple institutions. They carry out their different roles, like the church. Today, actually, I don't have my pastor hat on. I have my citizen hat on. And my goal is to teach you uh, not how to be a better member of your church per se, but how to be a better citizen of the United States, which we all participate in. You, you get the difference here? Um, I can work with you as a citizen, even though you don't belong to a church, my church, or even a church like mine, but because we're Americans, we can work together on Americanism. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's keep going here. Uh, individual freedom. We should, as individuals, we should have the freedom to choose our religion, to exercise speech, the press, assembly, petition, communication, and, and people are eternal spiritual beings temporarily living in physical bodies on earth. You know, this is a Judeo-Christian belief that, you know, long after the United States is gone, in fact, the whole world, I'm still going to be there there's still going to be a soul named Ed Wheeler living forever and ever. Anybody here agree with that? Right. That's the goal, that's the view of Americanism. And as sovereign people, we should be able to make our choices within, within you know, wide parameters. Here's another thing. Individual expression, like art, should reflect the real beauty of God in his creation. So whether it's music or visual art or dancing, all these things should be part of the harmony and, and the goodness of, and beauty of God. And then what about government? So government is of, by, and for whom? That's right, the people, self-government. It's not of, by, and for the courts. It's not of, by, and for a political party. It's the people. So there's a built-in distrust of centralized power that corrupts and enslaves. And political diversity is natural and should be respected. So government should be limited. It has its role, an important role, but it should be limited to that role. 
Seven, order and cooperation lead to progress and prosperity. And this is free decisions like free enterprise. We know now, now we've got a lot of history to prove that the way to make a, a country prosperous is to allow the people to be free, to make their own decisions um, about, for example, your labor. Nobody should tell you what kind of job you have to do. You decide. And when you find someone that's w willing to pay you what you need to do that job, you've got, that's, that's free enterprise at work. And we know that it, when you have millions and millions of decisions like that, whether it's purchasing or, or using your uh, services for someone, the whole society goes forward and you see prosperity and progress sort of automatically bubbling up. This was Adam Smith and these people knew it a long time ago. But it's now been proven, if you compare the countries where they try to control every little thing that's going on, those countries don't prosper. Eight, free exchange of ideas and viewpoints. In Americanism, we believe that even if you think, well, Wheeler, he's full of baloney, you know, go ahead, you can say that. And no one should stop you. It's free, it's free exchange. At the same time, you can't stop me from saying, even if you disagree with it, even if you think it's dead wrong, you have to allow me to express it. And the people will decide who's right and who's not right. So any ideas and viewpoints? Nine, a minimum number of laws that are strictly and impartially enforced. And we believe in a trial by jury of peers. Again, we're trying to decentralize things. Uh, we want a minimum number of laws, especially on a federal level, then a state level, then a local level. We keep things as close to the people as possible. And they should be strictly and impartially enforced. And 10, freedom of the individual citizens to keep and bear arms. Because your ability to bear arms represents your political power. And, and according to Americanism, every citizen should have political power. And if, you, if somebody can rule over you and terrorize you because you can't even defend yourself, that doesn't work. Okay, so that's a quick overview of Americanism. We'll come back to it in a minute. But now let's look at Marxism. An atheistic worldview that relies on human conflict to accomplish socio-economic progress. Now, a lot of people, the first time they hear that, they say, that, that can't be right. You know, nobody, nobody really believes that, do they? Uh, yes, they do. Atheistic worldview, so no God. And believe it or not, this is what they teach. And when we get into the roots, I'll explain it more. But they rely on human conflict to accomplish socioeconomic progress. That the way, the, the, the way to get, go forward or progress is to have conf conflict within your society. So you have oppressors and oppressed people and they're struggling against each other. And out of that is going to come some kind of progress. That's what they believe. So you say, well, you know, why are they doing this? It's creating all this uh, stress and, and, and strife. They want that. They, want, they, they, they think that something good will bubble up out of that eventually. So here's some characteristics of Marxism. First of all, now ultra, ultimate reality is the physical universe. That's it. Atheism. And to them, belief in God and religious faith is like a form of insanity. And you can study like the USSR and China and these places, they treat religious people like they're crazy. They want to lock them up, send them to concentration camps, try to re-educate them, you know, change them. Because there's no God, we can't see him, we can't taste him, we can't feel him, we can't see him, can't smell anything. That doesn't exist. The only reality is just the chemistry and the physics again and, and the biology, those things. That's the ultimate reality to them. And what is morality? So you don't have a God to tell you what's right and wrong. Morality is whatever advances the revolution or equity as defined by the party, the Communist Party. 
or the party uh, that they're trying to put in control. That's it. So lying, cheating, deception, they're all okay. As long as they are advancing what they consider to be the goals toward equity or revolution. Does that ring any bells here? Yes. See, you can get out, you can burn down buildings, you can, you can riot, you can destroy public property, destroy a federal court building. Very little will happen to you if it's advancing the goals of the left. The goal is to put more and more power in the government and more and more Marxism. Then it's okay. You can cheat your way through an election because you couldn't win in a fair way, so you're going to cheat your way in. That's perfectly fine. But you let anybody do one of those things on behalf of Americanism, of strengthening, oh no. They must be terrorists. They're they're into white nationalism. They all figure out some way to stop you. Even when you're not doing these things, they will accuse you of it. Okay? So there's morality. And what's a healthy society? It's supposedly equity between all citizens. And you have to understand, Marxists believe in what's called economic determinism. They, they think everything is really determined, all history is determined by economics. You think, oh, Jesus, he said some neat things and things like that, that's why we follow him. No, no, no. It's because of your economic uh, goals and your status and your, your desire to hold that over other people. And they'll, they'll figure out some way to try to explain even your religious beliefs in terms of economics. And they believe in something called the dialectic, which is, again, we mentioned uh, oppressed and oppressors. That would be like thesis and antithesis. When they conflict, you'll wind up with something brand new called a synthesis. That conflict will lead to a more healthy society. Now, there are a lot of things wrong with this. We'll get into it. But, you know, let's face it. If you take, take China or take any North Korea, Cuba, any of these places, you'll find out, yeah, most of the people are. They're, they're dirt poor down here. And then you got this tiny little group up here. They're like multi-gazillionaires, you know. They have whatever they want. So they, it's not equity. And they never do get to equity. All right, here's now individual freedom is highly restri restricted to whatever the party deems good for society. And there, if somebody starts to get ahead, you have to transfer their wealth down, spread it around all, all the other people. Um, and, and also people, instead of being eternal souls, they're just advanced animals. And there's no life after physical death. Okay? All important to keep in mind. Five, individual expression or, or, or art, music, it has to, the only requirement, it has to support the revolution. So you find out that their music, their poetry, um, their visual art is dark and demonic. It's not, it's not beautiful. It's pounding. So you listen to some of the things that even the young people are listening to right now. I mean, it's, it's hard to even call it music. Has anybody run into this or am I just, am I the only one? Right. Um, that's, that's Marxism at work. Six, government is by, of, by, and for the Revolutionary Party. It's not by the people themselves. It's, and most of even your communist countries like China, only a few percent, like three percent of the people are Communist Party members. You have to really um, jump through all the hoops to be that, and everything is determined by what they say. Um, that's their government, socialism, government control of the economy, and everything else, they extend their figures into education and um, media, art, all these things. All institutions are to be subservient or eliminated, like the family, parental rights, all that has to go, all right? Number seven, progress and prosperity resolve from conflict between the oppressed and the oppressors. So you have constant revolution, chaos, and conflict, and believe it or not, they like that. 
They want that. They feel that they'll be able to use that to advance their cause. So you say, man, look at all that, you know, what's going on out there. People are mad at each other and they're fighting and stuff. They want that. You want it to go away, you know, let me, let me just let, it, let us alone. No, no. That's what they feel will lead to progress and prosperity. Eight, no free exchange of ideas and viewpoints. Okay, it's just what the party says, that's what goes. So opposition must be demonized, crushed, and eliminated. A government thought control and totalitarianism. So as we go on today, we'll get into some specific examples, but uh, anybody notice this? You know, you can't have uh, divergent views on the global warming or climate change or these things. Oh no, 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 you're not allowed to even question. Or, you know, Dr. Fauci, whatever he says, that's, that's science. And if you disagree with him, you're going against science. They will often use the word science to cover up, you know, what they're pushing. And if you disagree with them, oh, you're against science. You're being, you, you are to be demonized, crushed, and eliminated. Nine, they believe in a profuse number of totalitarian laws that are selectively enforced, including secret, rigged, trials. So um, remember we said according to Americanism you want to minimize your laws, make sure everybody understands them, and then you apply them equally. We don't care if you're the president's son or his brother or his uncle or his nephew or the governor's uh, sister. or what. We don't care. The law applies equally to everybody and they're clear. Everyone understands them. Everyone makes sure that they're applied equally. Is that what we have now? No, because Marxism calls for a huge number of laws. Nobody can even know what they are. They can't even name them. They can't explain them. It takes, you know, a team of lawyers just to figure out, you know, how to set up a business, things like this. And then it turns out they only apply to certain people and they don't apply to other people. Uh, they like secret trials, rigged trials, rather than a public open trial of the uh, jury. And finally this, only the state can keep and bear arms. You are not allowed. And the state, remember, is the party. That's how they impose and maintain their viewpoint on things. So look, let's look at these things side by side. Uh, ultimate reality, for Americanism, it's God. For Marxism, it's just the physical universe. Morality, for Americanism, it's biblical standards. For, for uh, Marxism, it's advancing equality, equ equity. Everybody's the same. And a healthy society, according to Americanism, is multiple institutions. That's the thing to remember. It's not just freedom of the individual, but it's multiple institutions acting independent of the government. But uh, for Marxism, it's equity and conflict. Uh, then for Americanism, freedom is personal choice. In Marxism, freedom is the party's choice. Expression or art, music, for Americanism is divine, reflecting divine reality. For Marxism, it's just supporting revolution. Okay, number six, Americanism believes in government by the people. And Marxism calls for government by the party. In terms of progress, Americanism calls for freedom of the individual and freedom of choice. That's what free enterprise is all about. And free ideas and for Marxism, it's conflict and revolution, believe it or not. For Americanism, in terms of debate, it's free exchange. You can go ahead and say any crazy thing you want to. We're gonna let you and people will recognize if it's crazy or if it's right, they'll be drawn to it. Uh, in Marxism, it's just whatever the party says. You're not allowed to go out from that. Then for Americanism, its um, laws are just very, again, limited. For Marxism, they're profuse in number. 
And then finally, arms. For Americanism, it's the right of citizens to bear arms. And for Marxism, it says no, it's limited to the government, to the state. Okay, that's the end of part one. Does anyone have a question or a comment? There is a mic over here, if you want to use the mic. Um, we got a few minutes, we can um, discuss things if you want to, or we can take a short break and then go on to part two. What would you like? Anybody got a comment? Is this making sense? Is this working for people? Okay, good. We're going to take a very short break. And uh, what, five minutes, Gregory? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, five minutes. We'll meet back here. And we'll go to part two. He said, if they want me to be president, they can vote for me. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to go back to Vermont. That's Calvin Coolidge. You should be proud of him. And he was elected. People appreciated what he did. And he, he wrote some very good things. He says, you can't improve, you know, um, justice and liberty for all. He says, you can't improve on that. Now, we fail to carry it out sometimes, but you can't make a better statement than that. All means everybody. We don't care what your background is. If you're a human being, you're a U.S. citizen, you have equal rights, period. And that was right. And then here's the last one I'll mention is Ronald Reagan. Boy, you know, before he became president, he was traveling all over the United States. He worked for General Electric, and he was given, that's when General Electric uh, was still a good and um, gave lectures on, on the things that we're talking about today. So you can go back and get those. All right, now here's an example of Abraham Lincoln. You know, from the Gettysburg Address, it says, he talks about a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Again, you can't get, you can't get better than that. Everyone's created equal. And it was conceived in liberty. America is the first country. The whole idea was to grant power to people. And not kneel to some king or pharaoh or czar or something like that. That's, that was the history of the whole world until then. Almost. We'll, we'll, we'll see a, an exception here later. Uh, then he talks about government of the people, by the people, for the people. We talked about that. So you can quote all those people, all the, and I've got a lot of references in your um, notes there. Uh, you can spend a lot of time uh, studying those things, and that's your, your talking points. Okay? So let's go to roots of Marxism. First of all, satanic rebellion. Remember, Americanism starts with God, and Marxism actually starts with Satan. And Satan, as we mentioned, his M.O. is deception, then destruction. You see it right away in the book of Genesis. First thing was to deceive, you know, to twist the truth, the truth around. And then death comes as a result, destruction. And we see this all through history. Tempting people, deceiving them, and it leads to their destruction. I'm sure you all have your personal stories we all people in our lives, you know, they're, they're tempted. Ah, you don't need that. You don't need that Bible. You don't need God. You don't need these things. Just take these drugs. And uh, you, you'll be okay. And, they, and it seems to even work. Oh, man, I, I, that really felt good. You know, that was good. And they go back for more. Next thing you know, they're dead. Or their lives are ruined. That's deception and destruction. That's his M.O. 
All right, I won't, we'll, we'll see more specific examples later. Now here, as we move forward in our modern era, is the French Revolution is a root of Marxism. So before Marx was even born, uh, this was happening uh, in France. They were rebelling against the church, against the Bible, against God himself. And it was radical class conflict then, which eventually led to dictatorship. You know, the promise was, well, let's just go kill the king and kill all of his family, and then we'll kill all the nobility. Well, then we got to kill all the aristocrats. We kill, kill, kill the guillotines, you know, are just uh, running over time. And they still, they haven't achieved what they wanted. And there's still people, it's chaos, it's confusion, it's misery, it's not working. And then you wind up with Napoleon. Deception and destruction. The French Revolution. So you can go back to that. Then moving forward, we come to this character, Karl Marx. His books were The Communist Manifesto, Das Kapital, and then he worked on other, other things. Karl Marx was a despicable person. And you've got in your uh, notes there, there's um, The Devil and Karl Marx is one of the books in there um, that really, it, it quotes him over and over. His poetry was so vile and demonic that it defies description, really. You have to read it to see how twisted and vile it is. And, just to get, and then as a person, you know, he never had a job. I, I used to think, well, he must have been a professor in some big university or something like that. No. No, he, he never even had a real job. He sponged off his parents. They were, his father was a uh, successful attorney. They had means and he, would, he just sponged off him his whole life. He treated his own family, his wife and his children in a horrible way. He was also a major racist. Write that down. It's in that book. You see, his daughter made the mistake of marrying an African descent person. This is in England, of course. And he was a black man. There was nothing wrong. He was a good person. Karl Marx hated him. You know how he referred to him? The gorilla. He never called him by his name. He called him, where's the gorilla? That's your leader of Marxism, Karl Marx. And I often ask myself, how can people in their right minds respect this guy? If you know anything about his personal life, it is almost unbelievable. And then the ideas, well, it's all conflict. Conflict is going to somehow lead to revolution and lead to all the things that we want. It's a ridiculous idea. And yet it's permeating, especially our, our university. You spend thousands and thousands of dollars to send your kid off to college, and this is what they come back with. We'll come back to it. Here's another one, Charles Darwin. I will say, at least for Charles Darwin, he, he was a scientist. He did you know, catalog these thousands and thousands of bugs and birds and stuff, and he studied the feathers, and you know, at least he did some some real investigation on things. But he, again, he was a horrible person. And so his number one book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, everybody knows that name, that's his big book. But did you ever read the subtitle? The subtitle is The Preservation of Favored, what? Races. That means human races in the struggle for life. Uh-oh. Does that sound like what the Bible says? That all men are, and all men are created equal? No. But that's what he taught. And then he wrote a book called The Descent of Man. That's even worse. And he, he explains in there how the Aborigines, these people there in Africa, they will, never, they will never reach the intellectual capability of us Europeans and things. And the best, to let them go. We'll sterilize them. We'll, you know, get rid of them. That's what he seriously taught. 
and yet he's respected as a great authority on the origin of people in our universes even now. Patty? Of which movement? From the eugenesis, you know, like Margaret Sanger and Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You can take, oh, the eugenicist, yes. The eugenicist movement definitely comes right out of Darwinism. They refer to it often. Um, in fact, you know, I'm doing some study right now on early um, African Americans that were involved in the revolution and they're studying this. Uh, some of them got the, the first degree, in fact, the fourth person to receive a degree from Middlebury College was a black man. His name was Lemuel Haynes. So you can look up at Lemuel Haynes. The first black person in America to get a bachelor's degree was named Alexander Twilight. And that degree was conferred on him by Middlebury College. That's when Middlebury College was a thoroughly Christian institution. You know that they're studying, because it's Black History Month, they're studying these guys at Middlebury College right now. And some people are registering complaints. That yeah, these guys, they got these degrees, they were honored, they, uh, uh, but nobody even mentioned that they were black. That bothers them. Oh, this should have been highlighted. Yes, he's a black man. No, nobody cared. See, nobody cared. In the Christian culture, we don't care what your skin pigmentation is. And Middlebury College was living that out. Now, you fast forward some decades, and you come to Frederick Douglass. He was a friend of Abraham Lincoln. He was born a slave. For 20 years, he was a slave. But he's a brilliant, brilliant person, an orator, and he became a Christian also. He came to Vermont. You know, they would not allow him to speak at Middlebury College. That's right. They would not allow him to speak at the church in Middlebury. And he wound up in Ferrisburg, Vermont. I think it was either 13,000 or 16,000 people showed up to listen to Frederick Douglass out in the open air in Ferrisburg, Vermont. How many? 13,000 minimum. I, 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 if you're like me, you can't even picture 13,000 people fitting in Ferrisburg, but they did. <laughs> and Fer Frederick Douglass was the most photographed American in the 1800s. More photos of him than any other person in the 1800s. Frederick Douglass. Yes, Anne? Just say that there's a historical site marker on the Go to Ferrisburg. You'll see the site marker there. Why didn't they allow him to speak at Middlebury College? That's my question. It's on the screen. They had already been turned to Darwinism. These black people will never be equal to us. They ceased to be Christian. They were imbibing the evolutionary worldview at Middlebury College. Somebody at Middlebury College might be watching this. I'm challenging you right now to prove that I'm wrong. Why did they confer degrees on black people earlier and then not even allow a person like Frederick Douglass to speak on your campus? I'm, I'm a little bit on the side of track here. <laughs> um, let's talk about, let's go, go forward now. Roots of Marxism, getting right into our century. Uh, this guy is very important, Antonio Gramsci. Um, he wrote a book called The Prison Notebooks. He was an Italian communist. And he was a leader of cultural Marxism. Marx wrote mainly about economics. He, he wanted everything to be conflict between the rich and the poor and the, the slaveholder and the slaves and the oppressed and the oppressors. But, but Gramsci widened it. He made it cultural conflict. And he came up with critical theory, like critical race theory. This is the guy that started that. So racial conflict. 
And he started a thing called the Frank... They got kicked out of Italy and they went to Germany and they started a thing called the Frankfurt School. Then the Nazis kicked them out and they, you, you know where they landed? Columbia, not Vermont, Columbia, <laughs> Columbia University in New York City. And to this day, they have a prominent influence in Columbia University. And guess which recent pres president went to Columbia University? Anybody know? Obama, Obama right. And the roots go right back, right back into this. All right, so that's Antonio Gramsci. Then we have this, uh, Herbert Marcuse. He wrote The One-Dimensional Man and Reason and Revolution. His job was to take the ideas of Gramsci and the Frankfurt School and really popularize them through these books and speaking on campuses. He popularized cultural Marxism among college students. This is back in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. So it's become very rooted in our higher education system, these ideas. And it's all pure Marxism. The things that we talked about, those characteristics. So here's another actor, Saul Alinsky. He wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. How many people have ever seen Rules for Radicals? Yeah, just a few. Uh, you really should read that. Everybody that wants to know what's going on here, you'll see it. He, he became a mentor for Hillary Clinton. So a lot of her actions will make sense to you if you read that book. And it's all about how to how to um, discredit anyone that disagrees with you. You call, you call them names, you isolate them, you, you, you bring a lot of, uh, of disparaging uh, rhetoric against them. Absolutely. You cover up what you're doing by accusing them of doing the same thing and it just creates chaos in the people. Well, wait a minute, you know, I thought you were doing that, but you're saying they're doing it. And that's, that's, that chaos and confusion and conflict is exactly what they want. Remember, that's what we said, that that's, that's how you get progress? He made the roadmap for revolution based on mafia operations and Marxism. He lived in Chicago, and of course Hillary Clinton is from Illinois also. He actually spent months with the mafia leaders in Chicago studying their techniques of how they would take down their rivals. And then he applied that into the political sphere. And that's all in that book, Rules for Radicals. Um, you know, things like, like banks. You, you learn to, you, you get like thousands of people to go in and, 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 and uh, deposit one penny or something in the bank so you bring the whole thing to collapse. You, you tie them up in knots and then you promise not to do it if they'll contribute $10,000 to your, you know, your, your fund over here, your, your uh, community organizing fund. That's the kind of stuff, perverted stuff that Alinsky came up with. But again, he was the, um, became a mentor for Hillary Clinton. We'll come back to it. Here's another one, Howard Zinn, very important. He wrote a book called The History of America. And you would think, well, that's good. You know, we want our kids to learn history of America. No, every story in there is all from a Marxist perspective. And this book has been used in government schools, high schools, and colleges. And it's thoroughly Marxist concepts. It's all about conflict. You know, the Europeans versus the Native Americans. Boom, boom. And uh, the black people against the white people and the Chinese and this. You know, all, it's all through the lens of Marxism. The whole history of the United States. Nothing good, nothing to be praised, nothing to be, uh, to be proud of. Just to be ashamed of, you know, oh, our country is so rotten, so bad. That's the textbook your kids are getting. So roots of Marxism. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Any comments, questions? Yes, Bob. Was anybody speaking out against these developments in our country? That's a really good question. 
did, you know, when all this stuff was happening, we're going we're gonna to talk about how the invasion really took place, but it's a very good question. I'm glad you're asking that. Well, they felt. Can you repeat the question? Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. He said, he "says why? Why did we allow this to happen? Why you know didn't anybody speak out against this?" And I'm sure some people did speak against it. Uh, so I'll just tell you a quick example: is Harvard University. It started out as very Christian. Uh, that gradually it decayed. They gave up the confidence in the Bible and things like that. And then in the 1860s, just like overnight. They went from a basically Judeo-Christian worldview. It was it was de it was um, um, Unitarian and things like that. But basically, it's still a spiritual world. Overnight, they went to what I call evolution everything. It was some of the deans and the presidents. They just bought into everything that Darwin was saying, and they 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 even even the law school got taken over by them. So that now law is not something that comes from God, that's absolute, that we can, through the ages, fix on and order our societies. No, law is evolving. So that's, you know, and, and Harvard sets the agenda for schools across the country. It's, it's, it's always been, now if you go into your universities and say, well, who's in charge here? Who are the deans? Who are the heads of the different departments? A lot of them are Harvard graduates. So that's one of the things. And they just bowled people over. And people were, Christians were asleep at the wheel. We're going to talk about this. I call it failed defense. Successful offense and failed defense. And we're coming to that next. So let's take a little break now, Gregory, okay? Do you want to push through and, and get to lunch for like one o'clock? We can do that. Should we keep rolling? All right. Great. Thank you. All right. This is, we're going to get into Bob's question now. How Marxism invaded the United States? And it's in two parts. Successful offense and defensive failure. Fail to defend. So here's your goal. Be able to name at least three successful offensive moves in the history of the Marxist invasion of America. And your second goal, name three defensive failures in the history of the Marxist invasion of America. So let's, we gotta, we gotta congratulate them. They succeeded. And we need to bash ourselves a little bit. We have failed and we're continuing to fail. I'm going to get into why in a minute, but first of all, let's talk about the successful off offense. We, we talked about some of the players already, and they had a philosophy, it was called Marxism marching through the institutions. And that, I think it came from Antonio Gramsci, but some of you maybe uh, uh, remember that, um, uh, what's his name here, he's uh, uh, one of Obama's big buddies, um, William uh, Ayers, Bill Ayers. He was in the 60s, you know, blowing up, killing police, blowing up police stations and stuff like that, and then he left the country until statues of limitations ro uh, ran out, and he came back, and, and now he's uh, like running the education system in Illinois. And he used to talk all of, marching through the institutions. What are the institutions? The church, Education, government, business, corporations, we're going we're gonna to permeate all these institutions and convert them from Americanism to Marxism. That's the plan. So we're going to begin with education. We've already talked about universities, Harvard, Yale, academia. Um, Harvard is really the big one. They, you know, everybody tends to just want to be like them. Um, it was the first college in America, 1636. I mean, you know, the, the pilgrims are just paying off their debts still, and they started this college. Um, and it was thoroughly biblical for until at least 1701. That they only, if it wasn't in the Bible, they didn't believe in it and didn't want to teach it, didn't want to talk about it. Then for the next uh, 100 years, it was, it was mixed. You had a lot of biblical uh, people, but then also more and more um, 
as they got into more hard sciences and things like this, um, it became diluted. Then a very liberal, after 1800, by liberal I mean like Unitarian, and um, not Marxist yet, but uh, definitely no problem contradicting the, what the Bible teaches. That's what I mean by full-blown liberal. Okay, so, and they set the agenda for all the rest of the schools. I can't em emphasize that enough. Then we come to Yale. The same, see, when, when Harvard started to slide out of Orthodox Christianity, Yale picked up the slack. They said, you know, these guys, you know, they're wrong. So they started a new school, Yale, and uh, again, for about 100 years, thoroughly biblical. Then it started to be mixed up until 1860, then full-blown liberal after 1860, and that's when Darwinism came in and really knocked the Christian point of view out. All right? So, and that set the agenda. You know, everybody's just fallen in line. The universities uh, follow what they do. So, but if you study that process, what was going on there, you'll have a, a good grasp on what happened in higher education. And uh, then moving into more of our times, recent decades, uh, and Marxism itself. Uh, we had the Frankfurt School. Remember we said it moved to Columbia University after they lost out to the Nazis. The Nazis kicked them out of Germany. And they came here with their cultural Marxism and... Um, spread their ideas. Then we mentioned Marcuse already, uh, very popular among students in the 60s, and now we get to the public schools. So 1930s, John Dewey, um, you know up until that time a lot of people were, were home educated or a, a kind of a combination of a community, small community school the churches and schools were very closely associated. You know, they used the same building and uh, the people in the community to hire a teacher or two and the parents would be involved and that was education. And then they came along with this uh, uh, consolidated education. Let's, let's get them all together, you know, and bigger and bigger schools and they even take them out of the community. So now it's three or four towns together make a consolidated school. No roots left in the, with the church or the communities. Wipe out all that stuff. That's all on purpose. So John Dewey was a humanist. He helped to start the American Humanist Association. And he was a full-blown socialist. He was really a communist. And he's the one that designed our modern schools. Duh. Why should we be surprised? He openly mocked, when he, when he started the American Humanist Association, around uh, 1933, I think, they published the first humanist manifesto. You can look these up. And it says, we do not believe in a prayer answering God. And it's harmful to children to teach them that there is a prayer answering God. This is the guy that designed your schools that we're sending our kids off to. What do we expect, right? And how, how he got away with it, you know, I really don't get it. But he wrote a book in 1935 called Liberalism and Social Action. Again, it just set the stage for so much. Uh, one of the things they did was take over the teacher colleges. This is all calculated. So your, your public school teachers have all come through this mill that has taught them to teach in what I will call a basically Marxist point of view. No prayer answering God, that's for sure. And all this horrible past of the United States, we're such a horrible country, you know, there's nothing to be proud of, nothing to stand up for, no, 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 nothing to be patriotic about. Patty? Are you good friends with Margaret Sanger? Yeah, John Dewey, Margaret Sanger, definitely. Um, I, I don't know the exact details about it, but they certainly were coming from the same stream of thought. I mean, I think UVM even has a building that's named after John Dewey. I wouldn't be at all surprised. I think one of the first teacher colleges was at UVM. 
Right, so that would be a strong connection right there. And of course they just, again, they replicated this all across the country. All right, so that's education. Any questions or comments about education? Is this, is this making sense? Are we getting anywhere here? Okay. Um, now, government. Remember, that's another sphere. And uh, the progressive movement, mo movement. So one of the big leaders of this was Herbert Crawley. And he founded a journal called The New Republic. And he wrote a book called The Pro Promise of American Life. And basically, he's selling socialism. That's, that's what he is standing up for. And there was a number of them like him. Um, they injected these ideas into our society. So early 20th century, this started for a while. The politicians were just falling over themselves to who could be the most progressive in the early uh, 20th century. And uh, moving away from our own constitution, like Woodrow Wilson, he trashed the constitution. I'm coming to it here in a minute. So progressive uh, presidents. Uh, one of them, unfortunately, would be Teddy Roosevelt, post-presidency. You know, he was a president back in, I think, the 1890s or something. And then, and then he was out of office for a while. He ran again. By the time he ran the second time, he had become a follower of Crawley and was pushing full-blown socialism. Now he lost, but he lost to Woodrow Wilson, who openly trashed the Declaration of, Indep of Independence and the Constitution. He says, these are like shackles. We can't have these things holding us back here. We got to get going here with our socialist movement. And of course, all that was going before World War I, and that disillusioned a lot of people. Now we have World War II, and um, they had to get a little less enthusiastic about it. But um, then even Herbert Hoover, he was the other political party. Um, he was a big believer in, well, the government can run the economy. We just put people like me, an engineer, in, in charge of of the government and we'll tell all the businesses what they should be making and how many and how soon and all this kind of stuff. It doesn't work, but that's what he thought. And of course it led us straight into the Great Depression and um, then you get Franklin D. Roosevelt in the New Deal and some of his advisors we'll talk about in a minute. But their whole idea was to, you know, Oh, these people here, they're getting ahead. Let's take a bunch of their money away and give it to these people over here and uh, redistribute and, uh, and progressive, progressively more socialistic. And then there's this one, Lyndon Baines Johnson with his war on poverty, all based on income, income redistribution. And then there's Jimmy Carter who pushed the ERA and also Roe versus Wade happened, um, let's see, right before his time. But he, he was a big backer of it. He was extremely pro-abortion. So, um, and then the last one I'll mention is Barack Obama with Obamacare. He tried to nationalize and socialize our health care system. Hasn't quite succeeded yet, but um, Lots of damage along the way. So these are all roots of what we see now, the, social, the Marxist uh, penetration of the United States. Uh, then we have, those were the presidents. Now we have actually subversives. They're kind of under the radar, but they're guiding the presidents and influencing them a lot. Here's, here's Harry Dexter White um, in World War II, and then right after World War II, he was the U.S. Department of Treasury senior uh, tr Treasury Department official, first head of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And he had a, an important role in formation of the World Bank. Well, why do we care about that? Well, after the fall of the Soviet Union, they released a lot of their secret records of how they worked here in the United States. And here's what one of the secret agents said. The Harry Dexter White was the most highly placed asset the Soviets possessed in the American government. This is a major guy running the Treasury Department, the International Monetary Fund, 
and the, the Soviet Union records themselves show he was working for them the whole time. Now these are specific facts, you know, these are public facts that you can take to back up what we're saying today. Here's another one, Alger Hiss. Even today, some people say, well, Alger Hiss, he was, he was treated unfairly, you know, he, should, he shouldn't have lost his job and things like that, just watch. He was a U.S. State Department official, so we had a Treasury official, now we have somebody working over the State Department. They deal with all the international relations of the United States. And he was a Secretary General of the United Nations founding conference. He helped to start the United Nations. Okay? Who was he? He was a Russian spy throughout the entire 1930s and 40s. Again, it's the Soviet Union own records that tell us this. We're not making this up. So all these times he's made all this time he's making policy decisions for the United States, he's actually working for the communist government of USSR. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. So those are some examples of subversives in our, in our government. Um, then the United Nations. Right up to today, they're all socialists and communists at the top levels. Here's a great example. The guy running the World Health Organization, the director, Tedros Jebriezes. That guy, if you study his background, he was the health administrator for the communist government of Ethiopia. He's not an MD, His, he has a doctorate in like medical system administration, something like that. And he was handpicked by China to be the head of the WHO, right now, making all these decisions about the pandemic, the virus and the injections. Flat out communist. There are many other examples, we don't have time for them all. So that was the government. Uh, any questions? We talked about education, then we talked about government. Any comments or questions about those? Are we tracking okay? All right, now we're gonna move on to family and morality, because here's a name that's already come up, uh, Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood, and her racist eugenics. Again, you talk about a racist person. Here she was, she started Planned Parenthood. Oh, she's, you know, great, greatly to be admired, and. And touted like Hillary Clinton gave, got some Mar Margaret Sanger award or gave some award or something, you know, oh, just so wonderful. She was a flat out racist. If you read her books and things, um, she said we got to get rid of what she called the mud races. The mud races. And to this day, you're going to find out that most of the Planned Parenthood, the big clinics where they're doing so many of these abortion mills, guess where they're located? In the black communities of American cities. That is the legacy of Margaret Sanger. And this is another good question for you, Bob. Why, why don't the black people see this? Why don't they do something about it? This, a lot of that 60 million unborn babies that have been killed, a lot of them were black babies. Way disproportionate of their population. I think it's, the blacks are something like 12 to 15 percent of the population, but abortions is like 40 percent. More, more black babies that are aborted in New York City than are born. Yeah, and so New York City, more unborn babies are aborted than are allowed to be born. There you go. Now, a great book on this, it's in your references, is George Grant called The Killer Angel. Killer Angel is Margaret Sanger. What a shame. Now, here's another Margaret, Margaret Mead. She was an anthropologist and uh, supposedly a scientist, but I have absolutely no respect for her. I lived in a foreign country for 20 years. I learned their language. I learned every, a lot of things about their culture. She went over to uh, New Guinea. 
spent about like literally one or two months and came back and wrote books and she addressed Congress and all this. She wrote a book called Growing Up in New Guinea. She knew all about it. She had it all figured out. She was a complete fraud. And professional anthropologists came back and said, you know, they went over there themselves and spent adequate time and said, there's nothing like what she was talking about here. Because she kind of tried to come back and say, well, in New Guinea, the young people, they just engage in whatever sexual activity makes them feel good. And the parents don't care. Everybody gets along. Everybody's happy there. That's what she said. And that's, and that's why we got the playboy culture of the early 1950s. She addressed the Congress and told them that, and those idiots listened to her. She's got a PhD. So we wind up with Hugh Hefner. I, this is literally what happened. And it's a gigantic fraud. Remember? Deception followed by what? Destruction, right? We're getting to the destruction end of it now. But Margaret Mead, a complete phony. Here's another one. Alfred Kinsley, again, oh, he's a scientist. He knows so much. He's the one that gave us sex education and the destruction of sexual morals. Again, he did a bunch of phony um, so-called research. It turns out that really he was engaged more in sexual abuse of children than anything else. And there's a book that re, re, um, exposes this. It's called Kinsey Sex and Fraud by Judith Reisman. Again, it's in your list of references there that will show that this guy was nothing but a pervert claiming to be a great scientist. And people listened to him. There's also a movie called Children of Table 34. If you have the stomach, this will show you graphically this stuff this guy was into. So Bob Knight and Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. are the uh, moderators of this film. But he helped to start organizations, the, the homosexual movement, the GLAD and PFLAG, and the Kinsey Institute, which is still on the campus of Indiana University, and still pumping up the same lies and all anti-Christian morality. This is the takeaway. Destroy that Christian morality. Um, so that's Alfred Kinsley. And there's, of course, others. But there are major players that I've mentioned here. Um, now, here's this trend, feminizing everything, school, military, sports. You know, even our military, we want them to be more soft, you know, we got to go out and be like uh, global meals on wheels instead of a war machine, which is what the military is for. And China just laughs. You know, they're giving their, their soldiers uh, male hormones and stuff like this to make them more aggressive and more effective on the battlefield. They're over one million man army. And here we are feminizing everything. We want women, you know, to fly jet air flight or, and be in the, the trenches with men and things like that. How's that going to work? It's not going to work, folks. Feminizing everything. Now, of course, we're coming almost to an end point where, well, there's no feminine or masculine. Everybody's the same. And that's why boys could compete in the girls' sports because that doesn't mean anything anymore. Remember, chaos, confusion, conflict, that's all good to a Marxist. They want it. Is this ringing bells for anybody? All right, let's move on then. Also the homosexual movement. Uh, we mentioned that, Alfred Kinsley, very instrumental in that. Um, destroy the Christian morality and the transgender movement. Destroy even the concept of gender itself. You know, they wanna have these laws now where um, when you send your kid to school, you're not, you're not allowed to say if it's a boy or a girl. They'll, they'll figure it out. They'll talk to the kid and figure out what they want to be, and then that's what, that's what the kid will be. And the parents can't. There's a bill right now in the Vermont legislature, you should know about this, that legalizes this, 
that the, the, a kid can decide to change their, the, they call it the gender that their parents assign to them. They're allowed to change that. They can have hormones, they can have counseling, all these services without telling the parents. That's a bill in the Vermont legislature now. It's being debated now. I do not have the number here. Not hard to find it. Okay, so the chaos. Men are total jerks. Men can be women. All the chaos, confusion, conflict. That's what they want. All right? So any comments, questions about family and morality? Now I've saved my favorite one here till last. Churches. If I asked you, what's the most, if we went back to say 1900 or 1910, up to then, what was the most influential cultural institution in the United States? The church. Remember, no radio, no TV, a lot of people didn't have access to uh, even newspapers. But what did they do? All your little greens here, in every town in Vermont has got a green, and what's, what buildings are around that green? Churches. So once a week everybody go over there and one of the, all, often the most educated or one of the most educated people in the town is the pastor or the preacher or the priest. And he gets up and he comments on, the, uh, on current events and all kinds of things that are happening. And that's how people learn about those, as well as learning about God and the Bible and Jesus and salvation and all those other things. That was it. So you take a person like de Tocqueville, came here from France, and studies him. The church is just an overwhelming influence over people, but it's all free, too. People decide which one they're going to go to. Nobody can make them go. That kind of stuff. But most influential, and much more influential than the government. Because remember, education was often carried out between the families. It was recognized parents are responsible for raising their children. The church will help them, but the church can't do it for them. And the government definitely can't do it. That was life in America. And the communists look at this and say, you know, we are not going to get anywhere as long as those churches are doing what they're doing. As long as they have such a uh, strong influence over the people. So now I'll ask you my favorite question of the day. What was the very first communist front organization in the United States? What was it and when did they launch it? If you haven't been to this symposium before, you, might, you probably don't know. It was the first yeah, Communist Front organization in the USA. Here it is. The Methodist Committee for Social Action. And it was in 1912. Before World War I. Before the USSR was even born. The communists already were infiltrating the church because they realized the church has got to stop doing what it's doing or we're never going to be able to take over. They knew it and they launched that, the Methodist Committee for Social Action. Okay, so fast forward a few decades and you come to Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton grew up in a conservative Republican household in Illinois. In 1964, she happily went out there with her parents and campaigned for Barry Goldwater. How many people do that? Oh yeah. And then something happened. You see, they were not just good Americans, they were also strong Methodists. But their Methodist church hired a new student or um, youth pastor. A youth pastor. And that youth pastor had been trained in Marxism. And Hillary Clinton became a follower of that 
youth pastor, and through him, she got to know Saul Alinsky, that we've already talked about. So there you see a direct outcome of this. See, what was, what was the Methodist Committee for Social Action about? Social, notice the word social in there. When you see social justice, social this, social that, it's usually socialism. And they're, what they're doing, they're steering, re, redirecting the church. You know, you don't have to worry about God and salvation. He, you know, th those, those kind of things, that'll work itself out. What you need to do is help those poor people on the other side of town. You need to get, you know, you need to get involved with, or these poor countries, or we need open borders. We need more, we need more immigration, this kind of thing. Redirecting the resources, the attention, the focus of the church onto social action. Now that was just the first one. They've done it to every single dom denomination. And they haven't just worked on from outside, they've worked inside. Um, recruiting people for seminaries, for example. Now here's a good example. How many Catholics we got here today? Here's some, good. Yes. Um, did you ever hear of Bella Dodd? Oh, oh, it's in your references again. She um, lived from 1904 to 1969. She was a Communist Party USA uh, member. But then she flipped. In the early 1950s, she realized, wait a minute, you know, they, they were supposed to be about equality and they were going to make things better. And all we see is that they're killing people, you know. And, they, and she didn't like the way they were operating. But by that point, she had already helped to recruit 1,100 fake Catholic priests who would, ser who would ser uh, secretly go into seminary, they'd get out of college, go to seminary, become model priests, get as high up in the hierarchy as they can go, and then when we tell you, we'll get in touch with you and we'll show you what to do how to redirect the resources, the attention, the focus of the Catholic Church to what we want, away from what God wants. She testified in the U.S. Congress in 1953. It's a matter of pub public uh, record to take over the money and the language of the Catholic Church. She was a Catholic herself, and she returned to the church by this time. So she felt grief over what she had done. So you can look at Bella Dodd. The Bob asked, you know, how these things happen? Well, I'm, I'm trying to explain. So this is the offense part. They, it, it didn't happen by accident. It happened by design. There were people focused, studying the situation and taking action against us. Now, we got some Catholic friends I appreciate them very much, but we got this guy, and I have to ask myself, where did he come from? He was in Argentina before he became the Pope, I uh, worked his way up, but we know that he is a Marxist, and now he's packing the College of Cardinals with like-minded people. Do, am I stepping on anybody's toes here, or, or do you want, does somebody want to tell me? I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. Um, for example, this is one thing he did. The Chinese church was ordered by Pope Francis to obey the Communist Party of China, the Chinese Communist Party. For the first time. Uh, up until that time, the Catholic churches in China, they suffered miserably. They were killed. They were tortured. But they said, no, we're, we're, we're going back to our church. They tell us what's right and wrong. Not you, to the government. Well, we already said that's unacceptable to Marxists. No, we decide what's right and wrong. Not your church, not your Bible, not your God, not anything else, but us. They resisted that until Pope Francis comes along and he tells them, no, whatever the... Chinese Communist Party tells you to do, you do it. Now that's one very clear-cut example. But also on, mem on issues of marriage and uh, sexuality, morality, and these kind of things, very questionable. And I have to ask, was he one of these kind of people that 
Bella Dodd was talking about. That was just her personal involvement, 1,100 priests, who were, and they all went up in the hierarchy. They were smart, you know, and they were focused and um, doing these things. So that's the Catholic Church. Uh, now, the World Council of Churches was founded in 1948. Now, a lot of people don't realize, but it was rooted in the 1910 uh, worldwide missions movement uh, that was supposed to take the gospel, the truth about Jesus dying in our place, providing eternal life for all those who put their, put their trust in him, and then we're going to take that around the world, and it was a good movement, uh, but right away it was infiltrated by leftists, and they started to lose the edge of preaching the gospel, telling people how they could obtain eternal life through belief in God and, and his word and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And instead, oh, we got to go social action. So um, even today, a lot of our big denominations are part of this World Council of Churches. I, I call it a 90% Marxism and 10% Christian. You know, they'll use Christian terms. They'll talk about Jesus and talk about God and things uh, in general terms. But they're not preaching the gospel itself. They're not teaching what the Bible itself teaches. Their whole emphasis is things like open borders or, um, you know, helping the poor, which we want to help the poor, but that's not the major focus of the church. The major, major focus is to obey Jesus, go into all the world and preach the gospel. But they don't want to preach the gospel because they have been infiltrated. So there are many other examples of this. Um, if you're in a church, you know, the, do not let them give money to this World Council of Churches. I mean, it's rotten. And a lot of your big denominations, they've been infiltrated, like the Methodists, the Presbyterians, they've been heavily um, infiltrated. Now, until recently, there, a lot of your evangelicals were holding out against these trends, but they have been targeted now. Um, just like the other churches. So one of the most, re the, the largest non-Catholic denomination in the United States is the Southern Baptists. And uh, they started aiming their guns at them in the 1990s. So among evangelicals in general, we, the Gospel Coalition, I hate to say it, has been infiltrated. And there's a book in your, it's in your references called Marxianity that will give you a lot of details about this. Tim Keller, David Platt, Rick Warren, we've studied their books in my, the church where I am the pastor. And um, I didn't even realize a lot of things, but just slowly, again, redirecting the emphasis from what Jesus told us to do to what the communists want us to do. So I call it at this point maybe 10% Marx and 90% Christian, something like that. But there, the problem is the direction that it's going. And um, so they want to infiltrate. So that's part of the successful offense. Now here's another whole area, that's media and the general culture. So movies, what's the number one the number one determinant of values in the United States today, do you know what it is? It's movies, but t including TV. That is forming people's values more than any other thing, more than the schools, more than the churches, more than anything else is movies. Because they very subtly uh, infuse values in, as people, as young people especially watch them. All right, so um, note a belief system is at the core of any nation. And then you have the culture coming, expressing that, and then politics are following that. So too often, you know, we're going after the politics, but if we're ignoring the belief system and the culture, anything we do in the political sphere is going to get wiped out quickly. And the Marxist under, that's, that's the whole basis of cultural Marxism. They understood it. Now, in terms of this general belief, well, one important event would be this. What they're trying to do. They want to embed the same process in 2020, 
going forward forever. Then there's the Equality Act, criminalized traditional morality. This is this would make it illegal for me to say, well, marriage should only be a marriage, uh, a, a union of one man and one woman for life, just like the Bible says. It says it in Genesis. Jesus said it too. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Catholic Church is. Taught. That's what all traditional churches have always taught. Now it's against the law. That's where they want to take us. The transhuman movement. Uh, how many people know about this? The transhuman movement. Combining computers with human life. So you can look up these guys. Elon Musk is in on this. And this guy Yuval Harari is one of the scientists behind it. He has openly mocked the idea that God created us. No, it's just been this slow, billions and billions of years we've evolved. But now we're going to supercharge that process of evolution by combining our computer technology with biology. And they're going to, they want to put chips in you, in your brain, in your body somewhere. And I feel we've got, the country's gotten into. Uh, so now uh, what do we do to get ourselves out? And... Um, Okay, we're going to go ahead and start. So how to strengthen Americanism and combat Marxism nationally. So you can be thinking about these things. Almost any activity, um, this becomes a relevant thing. And our, our goal here is to be able to state, each one of you be able to state three actions that you can take to promote Americanism and combat Marxism on a national level. And um, to begin with, I want to talk about some general requirements and even attitudes uh, for all the actions that we take based on what we've learned here. And uh, the first thing I want to ask is, should we give up? Anybody think we should give up? Just go ahead and go hide under the bed. Tom, you think we should give up? Okay, Tom is bringing up. We do live in a republic, and Tennessee and Texas and Florida are places that Vermonters could go. I just throw that out. I see. I'm, I'm, for the camera, I'm going to repeat your, your comment that you uh, so you said now your comment is more relevant to what you do in Vermont. Because right now we're talking about what we do on a national level. And I think Tom's saying, well, Vermont, if, we, if, they, if they can't turn around no matter what we do, maybe we should find another state uh, to move to. So that does, you know, we got a point there. But we should, should we give up nationally? Good. We, I think we're all agreed. No. But, huh? There's no place else to go. That's right. There is no other place to go in the world. Um, so let's just think about how... This stack up. What do the Marxists have based on what we've just been talking about? They have academia, they have the big schools, they have media, they really dominate the, you know, the, the culture, the music, the, the films and TV and so much of those things. Uh, they, they dominate most of the government institutions uh, and they d dominate cultural business centers um, and, and, you know, a lot of other things. We're just swimming. Even the churches, they've, they've moved into a lot. Um, so that's very daunting. And so you can see how some people do. Some people say, well, how do you sleep at night? Well, I'll tell you why here in just a minute. Um, we have this. We, we have God. And, uh, you know, I, I really believe this is not theory to me. This is, this is real. 
How many people believe that God's right here now? Yeah, and he, know, he knows. And, and by the way, how powerful is God? Right, all powerful. He doesn't, he's not just here, he's everywhere, and he can do anything. So uh, that's huge. Um, he, he can change things. So that's why I sleep at night. And then what else do we have? We have truth on our side. We have scripture on our side. And we even have common sense on our side. Uh, think about truth, you know. I mean, isn't it kind of against common sense to say that, well, you get to decide if you're a boy or a girl. Where, where, does, that, uh, where does that stack up with common sense? It, it does not. And fortunately, the leftists have pushed so far, you know, in, in their agenda that you don't have to be some kind of a um, strong Christian or something to realize something's wrong here. And I don't want you to do this to my child, you know. Uh, so common sense is on our side. And, and we see this again, uh, rejecting medicine that's it's readily available, it's safe, it's inexpensive. But you can't have it. Your doctor's not even, your doctor can't even prescribe it. I know a doctor, he went, he's, he's retired, but he does part-time work in the hospital. He goes in the hospital, he says, now if I get a COVID, he went to the pharmacy, he said, if, if I get a COVID patient, I want to prescribe ivermectin. Will you fill it? No. And so we'll be glad to uh, educate you on this. He's the doctor, and this is the pharmacist telling him. Is that common sense? It is not common sense. This man knows many people that have been um, cured. They've been, let's just say, rescued from any uh, extreme symptoms from COVID by taking ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and these other things. So common sense is on our side. Um, and then this, um, most people, at least 80 million people in the United States and growing are actually into what we're talking about. Now why is 80 million? That, that's important. You know there's no Western European country that has 80 million people. We have more than that just in our side that voted for President Trump that uh, uh, strongly agree on matters of Americanism. So keep those things in mind and do not give up. Okay, so yeah, so here they stack up side by side. I say we have the winning hand. Who has the advantage? We do. Can we do it? Yes, we can. So getting back now, what's the general requirements for all the actions we take? One, it has to be biblical. And this is just myself and uh, Jewish people, other Christians, other um, backgrounds should say the same thing. We're looking to God himself, to his word, to inform us uh, so that we can have confidence in the things that we're standing for. And that he will be standing with us too. Uh, second, it should be logical. It, could, it should make sense, unlike some of the things that we see coming from the other direction. And it should be practical. That means it has, it has to be doable. You know, sometimes we get ideas about, well, what we wish could happen, but actually is it realistic at this point of time to get this through? And it, it leads me to the thing, even supporting candidates. You know, there's no perfect candidate. You can mention any candidate for any office and I guarantee they're going to have some flaws because the Bible says everybody is flawed. But are they the best person that's available right now running and can they do many of the things that I would like them to do? If that's all yes, I'm going to vote for them. And, and maybe I'm going to get out there and, and work for them, campaign for them too. So that's being practical. Okay, any comments about that? Does that make sense? Then uh, we want to talk about the first, the first type of action that we want to take to um, achieve our goals on a national level is spiritual actions. And the first one is to pray. Um, how many people believe that there's power in prayer? Yes. Very good. And trust, yes. Of prayer and fasting, right. So all, all kinds of prayer, you know, there's different kinds of prayer. There's prayer all by yourself, prayer with your, 
your spouse, if there's prayer with your family, there's prayer with your church, there's small group, big group, you know, all these kinds of prayers, and then prayer with fasting and sincerity, all these things go together, prayer and worship, praise, uh, all those things are important. And you know that God is watching. And he pays attention. And you can read in the Bible where, you know, the enemy's coming in. They're about to crush, to crush the people of God. And then they pray. And guess what? He just wipes them out. They don't even have to do that much. Um, and that's the way it is for us, too. Um, and then the second thing is preach. We need to, to spread the gospel itself. Jesus died in our place. He's, he's opened up the, the path to heaven and eternal life. And, and then all the other things that we get from Scripture, too, we need to spread that, preach. These are spiritual activities uh, that we want to ask God to enable us to do. And then we have this, the engagement part, where you actually, it's, it's spiritual to go out and meet others. Believe it or not, going to your town meeting, going to your county meeting is spiritual because you're going to meet other people, people that you didn't know before, and it, that's a spiritual activity too. This is, see, this is why I love in-person meetings. We can record it, we can go on the TV and all this kind of stuff, but there's something special about being in the room, being face to face, and actually it's something spiritual. Because God is here and he's working among us and he's, he's doing things with us that we couldn't get just on our own or even sitting home staring at the screen. Okay? There's information, but this is more than information. This is bringing people together and we're all spiritual beings. So engaging. And then, uh, fourth, attend and support churches that preach the whole Bible and the true gospel. So um, those two elements you should be looking. The, the true gospel means, uh, again, how we connect with God, how we find salvation. How, those are the important things. And we've talked about how the churches have been corrupted in many cases and they stop preaching. That, oh, that's not important. Just give to the poor. You know, love your neighbor as yourself and you'll be okay. No, that's not enough. And we want to preach the whole Bible. All the principles that God has given us uh, as family members, as church members, as members of our society, in business, how we deal with people honestly in our labor and, and producing things, buying and selling things. All this is actually comes under uh, spiritual action and it's your personal uh, relationship with God that's involved. Okay? Secondly, uh, educational actions. So, our young people what should we be teaching them? We should need to teach them respect for God. The very, very first thing we started talking about is that being taught in your schools. You know, in Deuteronomy, it says to parents, you need to teach them when they come in the door, when they go out the door, when they're sitting around, whether they're working, whether they're leisure, you need to keep my word and a pres the presence of God in their focus. Teach them respect for God. So that's something we need to do. Um, if it means home education, um, Christian school or religious school, uh, then we really need to ask God to help us to do that. But, and, and if some people have to send their kids to public school, they're not gonna get respect for God in that public school. Not in Vermont and, and not most places now. That means you gotta teach to them at home. Uh, so, so you can't, you can't do what we talked about. Just relinquish your responsibility for raising your children. Let the kid, let the school do it. That that will be catastrophe. You need to do it, and and begin with your own respect for God. Then, the second, teach the founding documents. What are they? Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. You should read them with your kids. It's written. They're written in a simple way and they're not that long. They're meant to be understood by ordinary people. And then that gives them a foundation of what it is to be in this greatest country that's ever existed. That's what I believe about America myself. And why, why it is. So we need to teach them. Again, they're, unfortunately in the school, they're, they're not gonna get it in too many cases. They're gonna get something very different um, so we can do it. 
and then third, teach the, the evils of Marxism. And so that they can identify it the way we're learning to identify the characteristics and why it's evil. And, um, and then the alternative, uh, as we already mentioned, in God. Then uh, teach patriotic engagement, Americanism. You know, when you go to um, patriotic events, and even you can take them to the Capitol and places like that, show them how government works, uh, introduce them to people, they share their values, and, and get them comfortable so that they will, when they grow up, they will want to be involved themselves. And uh, we're just not doing this enough. <laughs> Partly because we're not doing it. So how are we gonna teach our kids? So you gotta be engaged and then you gotta teach them uh, patriotic engagement. Okay, any questions up to this point? Is this making sense? It's not rocket science or anything. Did you have a comment, Regina? You say the co the co-ops, especially food co-ops. Yeah, it's a mentality, right? That, that is very dominant. We notice that now, like in the food co-op in Mod Middlebury, they stopped requiring. Oh, I know they've allowed. To, you can go in and, and eat lunch there now. They they shut that down until now. Um, so a little bit of a crack in the dike. Yes. No, I'm not. See, anybody can wear anything they want to, as far as I'm concerned. But I, I am a scientist. I know science. Scientifically, it does not make sense. Health, it's against you because you're getting that CO2, and it is a sign of submission to a government. So, but can you wear a mask? Absolutely, go ahead and wear it all you want to. But I can express my views on it also. Absolutely. But you can't say, you can't say that it's stopping virons because virons are 0.1 micron in diameter. Your mask only at the very best stops 40 microns. That's way bigger. And most of them, it doesn't even work that well. It's more like 100 microns or even nothing if there's a crack in the side. You see, they don't work. But you can wear it. I, I would never tell anybody, you can't wear that. No, I'm not saying that. But you, you see, you can't change science, real science. Yes. Right. Right, well that brings up another whole point. Um, the only person that you can control is Yourself. you. Right, exactly. So, and uh, now after all the ranting and raving I've just gone through, once in a while I wear a mask. Because I go down to the hardware store, they make you put one on, they got them, so I'll, I'll grab a new one and go in to buy, you know, some nuts and bolts or whatever I need. I actually have a little piece of paper that I will leave behind. You know, say, look, I needed something from your store. You wanted me to wear a mask. It's your place, so I wore the mask. But then I have the scientific reason why I don't like masks, the health reason, and the government reason why I don't like masks. And if I can avoid it, I will not come back. Goodbye. Yeah, well, often you can get away with it. Yeah. 
already back. So right. Never, and, and see, that's a whole other point. I held my breath if I got next to a person who was elderly, just in case, because we didn't know as much early on. But I did not wear a mask. Right. So yeah, Tom? I like the comeback. Does it your man's work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. It is respect. But you see, what's your name? Virginia. Virginia brought up, well, what about respect for the other person? I do have respect for the other person. That's why I'm telling them the truth. I like my, my children, I don't, I don't want to lie to them. I want to tell them the truth. Now, they don't have to agree with me, and they can come back. Well, it is definitely their right. It's definitely their freedom to wear it. But they can't choose their scientific facts. That's different. Now, if you have some scientific facts you want to come back on me with, you can. But saying that you're free to wear it is absolutely true has nothing to do with science. And the government making me wear it also has nothing to do with science. Sorry. Or health. Or health. It's actually against my health. Now, at the same time, I will say, I, I, I had my own business for a long time here in Vermont, and I have a lot of um, uh, sympathy with business owners. I mean, if the government tells them they have to do this, I, I, I feel for them. Uh, they're, they're caught in the middle. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I have to respect that. And they own it. See, if they own the place, and they, they're trying to follow the rules. I will go along with those rules in, in, in many cases because of respect for them. And they got something I want. So they, when I set foot in there, I am operate on their rules. I, I will admit that. But let's face it, if there's another hardware store that doesn't make me wear a mask, right down the street, I'm going there. John? Oh, you, you, no comment? I agree with you. Right. But did they make you go in there? No, but yeah, I see that that's it's my choice to go in. I want the nuts and bolts. It's my choice. I know what the rules are. It's their place. I'm going to follow their rules. But as soon as I get out of there, that's over, and I may leave that little note behind. It only says that it's it's it's, it's a tool. Of, for the government to dominate us and to take control over us. So there's a little hint there of what the agenda is behind it. Um, okay, good discussion. I like the discussion. Thank you, Virginia. Okay, media actions. So those were all personal, you know, spiritual kind of things. Now, media actions. Here's some things. We need to starve this fake media. You know, get out of Facebook, get out of Twitter, get out of those things, because we have some great uh, alternatives now with um, Rumble, and now True Social's coming online. And um, how many people watch frankspeech.com? Oh, only a few. See, we're, we're getting some ground here. Frankspeech.com, that is, I have it going like 24-7 in my house. And uh, that's Mike Lindell and, and, and Dr. Um, uh, Frank and people like that with him. Um, it's, it's so much better than even, even supposedly conservative like Newsmax and Fox News. There's certain places they won't go. They will not question the 2020 election in Fox News. And, and it, even though, you know, here in Arizona, they have a, a motion to take down their... Um, electors, they won't even talk about it. They don't have to say they support it, but they should just say, well, you know, the Senate in there is getting ready to vote. And oh, no. Can't mention it. Newsmax the same way. Can't mention it. But frankspeech.com, you'll get it point by point exactly what's happening now. So starve that fake media and support the alternative media. That's, that's the whole point there. Um, anybody else have some favorite examples? Epoch Times, absolutely, very good. That, that is a magazine, it's a newspaper, and then they have an online version, Epoch Times. It's all run by Chinese people. And uh, people that don't want 
the Communist Party of China to take over America and they've seen it happen and so they're putting out some very good stuff epoch times so that's another good one and another one would be uh, uh, WMD uh, or WND World Net Daily um, I think that oh, I think a lot of these are in your references there okay now here's the third thing which I already touched on support low-tech communication that means face-to-face -face here you know whenever possible because I tell you there's power in low tech it, there's power in relationships power in networking and uh, we need to take advantage of that and then support honest journalism these are all things we can do in media actions and when we see dishonest uh, journalism we should uh, stand up against that okay anything else anybody have a comment on media actions Tom Yes, Rumble. Yeah, I mentioned that. That's an alternative to uh, what Facebook and there's several of these. Uh, there's Gab and there's uh, Telegram. Telegram. Yes. So you know, use them, and so that they get stronger, and we suck the life out of these uh, fake ones. If 80 million people do this, believe me, that's going to hit them where it hurts. Okay. Now, government actions. Now we're starting to get into what we do in the sphere of the government itself. Uh, expose Marxism in all areas, that'll keep you busy. Uh, they've, as we've gone through uh, these different things, you need to recognize it and, and, and um, expose it. Remember we talked about how the Marxists don't believe in these other institutions like the family. They're trying to tear the family to pieces. They're trying to destroy parental rights. So these things you see in the schools, that's, that's not an accident, that's deliberate. They want to be in charge. So a brand new movie is coming out soon, by the way, is called Whose Children Are These? I think that's the name of it. Whose Children Are These? Do they belong to the parents or do they belong to the government? And I know Sam Sorbo is one of the producers of it. But, and I haven't seen it yet, but, but it's coming soon. I think the trailer's available. Uh, whose children are these? And it's, it's talking about the government wants the children to belong to them. They want to teach them, do what, whatever, brainwash them however they want to. And parents, what are, that's why they don't want parents to go to board meetings, uh, school board meetings. That too. Their control over them. So, um, so that's a great you know, example of, of, of Marxism, full-blown Marxism being played out right in front of you. Uh, then support patriotic candidates. Now, um, of course, we're talking mainly on the uh, uh, national level because we do have resources of the internet and things. You can research and go in there and find out, especially the primaries are coming up. Um, unfortunately, I wish I could say that we could just back one party all the time and you'll be fine. Uh, no. There's a thing out there called the Uni Party. Has anybody heard of the Uni Party? They're really, they're, they're all together on this Marxist agenda and they're in both of our major political parties. You'll notice they're playing ball together all the time. And wait a minute, I thought you were opposition, but you're going like you're you're funding, you're doing these things that the other side wants. That's called uniparty, and uh, we need to get rid of that. We need to get people who are consistently patriotic in their voting record and back them. And you can. Again, uh, what I like to stay below the radar, I mean, I don't have a ton of money anyway, but I just send a little bit of money to a lot of people all over the country. You can research it. Oh, yeah, that person's really got it down. And in the primaries, because if they don't get through the primary, forget it, they're done for this cycle, right? So you need to do your research now. So there might be a slew of people running, all the trying to become Congress represent, congressional representatives of North Carolina. You can find out who's real, the real deal and who's just a phony. And you send 25 bucks or 10 bucks to the real one. And do this all over the country. Senate, Congress rates, uh, uh, governors, etc. 
support patriotic candidates. You can do it. Then protect free speech. Man, this is under such assault right now of uh, free speech. They're trying to tell us, you know, they're trying to pass laws. Of, well, if you, can, if, you, if you question our uh, climate change agenda, you're a terrorist. Or if you uh, question uh, Black Lives Matter, you're, you're a terrorist. Uh, even if I was wrong, I should have the right to say what I'm saying. And it's just like it's just like the mask. I don't care if somebody wants to wear a mask; they can wear it. It's, that's that's freedom. I am pro freedom. Okay, and it's free speech. Um, they're trying hard to eliminate. They want to have this hate speech. Uh, if some people had their way, um, I would be shut down every Sunday morning because. The stuff that I'm saying is that Jesus is, he's really special, you know. There's actually nobody else like him. And, and he's done a lot of things that nobody else could do for us. Oh, you can't say that because then somebody might be hurt over here. The Buddhist might not like it or somebody. And uh, that's hate speech. That's seriously what some people want to do. So you need to be aware and protect that free speech. Then protect free and fair elections. Another humongous subject right now. If you go on frankspeech.com and look at all the different programs on there, it'll show the multitude of ways that our election system is being perverted. It's been going on for a long time, and then it went on steroids in 2020 because they used the, the, they used the pandemic to almost destroy our election system. And I, I talked to you before about the mules and the cell phones and the cameras. Uh, so proof of this is coming out and we need to get things in place that will uh, at least reduce this. There's people on the, on the rolls, like millions of people still on the, on the voter rolls that are not, they've moved out of state or they've died or something like this, you know, and they keep them on those rolls so that they can use their names to make phony votes. So we need to work against all of that. And it's, it's here in Vermont too. You might think, well, Vermont's hopeless anyway, but that's how I feel sometimes. But uh, that's what Tom's talking about. But, um, and, and I'm not an expert on this. Maybe somebody here knows more about it, how you go to your county level and you can be a poll watcher or even a poll worker. They have to hire people from both major parties, all the major parties. Do you have a comment, Martha? Right. Right, right. So your party, the way it works, they have so many of these justices of the peace. They, they try to keep it fairly balanced, but sometimes, like Republicans, don't even put enough candidates up there to fill them. Um, so that's uh, that's something that needs to be done um, for free and fair elections. Yeah, so their, their election comes up in November. So before now and then, in your county, you need to make sure that your party has a full slate of those uh, JP candidates. Yes, you got a comment there? Yeah, uh, Gregory? Pastor, uh, last Wednesday I spoke in, um, in um, Brattleboro at the Wyndham County Republican meeting for my lieutenant governor campaign. And there was a lady in the audience that there, it's two parts. Um, the Board of Civil Authority, which is elected in November, is your party puts names forward, they go on the ballot. So in Rutland City, where I hail from, there's 15 of them. And uh, of the 15, they, uh, so you'll get in the primary, you'll get the Republicans and Democrat, and then the people decide on who. Now this lady in Broward, never heard of this in 30 years of being involved in, in politics and the making of public policy in Vermont. Um, there's a way to get you know, people from both parties. It's not the Board of Civil, Civil Authority. What's the other word you use? 
The ju justice of the peace. Justice of the, no, no. So maybe it is Board of Civil and Poll workers not. and poll justice, watchers. Yeah, well, justice of the peace, you, you, you can perform weddings, and you're also in on your local tax um, uh, uh, deep tax uh, rebates and debates and stuff like that right, about, right. Um, I'm trying to think of the actual word, somebody that's coming in to fight their taxes. <clears throat> so what this lady did in one of the towns down there, she did some research and <clears throat> the Republican Party, or the, another party in Burlington, probably the progressives too, the three, they can send X amount of numbers depending on your town's population to that board that will do stuff like Ed's talking about but you're not on the board of civil authority doing tax abatements or marrying people. So you're not a full justice of the peace. I will try to find out more information and Martha is trying to get everybody's email emails because I didn't do a good job on the front end and I apologize. Um, but so, cause we, we like to communicate with the attendees after you folks after Martha has been really good with that. We've said, other things, but so there's something here. If your town, if you call your town clerk and say, "Hey, are there any Republicans that are on, on the, on the?" I, I don't know the actual verbiage, uh, phraseology, but I'm uh, like, because um, board maybe it's board of civil authority and justice of the peace is you're elected. Now, when I was on the city council in Rutland, I was automatically a, you know, on the board of civil authority for tax uh, abatements and stuff like that. So there's something here. So you may want to check with your town, but there should be an equal number of Republicans and equal number of Democrats. And, and pastors, correct that uh, there's so many things that are going on in our in our uh, government from unelected people that there's no accountability of that we need to start stepping up ourselves. So we're going to do some more research on that and get it out there because yep. I think that's really Brattleboro's doing it now. Brattleboro's Little Burlington. So I just wanted to bring that up because. It, it, but I haven't thought about it since that meeting until you guys talked about it. But thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Yes. From people that I know that have held that role, it's not a real, the justice of peace role. It's not real time consuming. <coughs> right. It is very important. And right. anybody in this room probably could be a candidate. Right. And you know people that can be. So very good. Okay. And finally this, <laughs> we're going to jump here. Uh, warn of nuclear blackmail. Uh, this is real. Now I... Like Gregory said, I put this together last July, and it was definitely true then. It's even more true now, because Afghanistan is gone, and they got $86 billion worth of our military hardware. They got the great big Air, Air Force base there um, for nothing. We handed it, and guess who's going to have it? The Chinese. The Taliban will sell everything they have. Uh, and the Chinese have got the money. So, and now, um, Russia is invading Ukraine. Now, I haven't heard, I didn't hear anything since early this morning, but is it gone yet? I mean, it's getting close. They're, they're in the capital, they're, you know, killing people right and left, and, you know, the people are fighting them with rifles, but in the end, the Putin doesn't care how many Russian soldiers get killed over there. He's taken it. He's made up his mind. And nothing's going to stop him. So, uh, and you know, the real tragedy of, of Ukraine is when the Soviet Union broke up, they, have, they had a lot of nuclear weapons. And they have nuclear material in Ukraine. Uh, so they were able to protect themselves and they were supposed to be a buffer between Russia and Western Europe, you know, a neutral country and a neutral country that could stand on its own two feet. Well, we came along, the Americans and the British and who were all being influenced by Russia, of course, and said, you need to give up those nuclear weapons as they're dangerous, they cost a lot of money and we'll give you some aid and you, you get rid of those nuclear weapons, give them to Russia or destroy them, do something, get rid of them. And, and they said, well, how are we going to protect ourselves? Don't worry, we'll protect you. That's what they said. And now look where we are, look where they are, those poor people. Warn of nuclear blackmail. Um, you can look this up online, Vostok 2018, V-O-S-T-O-K 2018. This is a mil it's one of maybe the biggest military 
um, practice operations in all of history. It was 300,000 military um, personnel all together from China and Russia. So there's senior Chinese military people and Russian military people overseeing 300,000 people with, they had aircraft, they had tanks, they had everything. And they were practicing an assault on Western Europe and or the United States. 2018, um, we need a strong military or they're going, they can uh, pull the lever on that any time. The other thing they're doing is sabotaging our military. While they're building up over there, they're doing everything they can to weaken our, you know, I don't know exactly where to start, start but um, they are trying to weaken our defenses while the other side is increasing their offensive capability. And now Russia has shown us they don't have a conscience. If they can get away with it, they will do it. All right, so those are, are general areas of actions, government actions. Now I want to talk about response to current challenges. And the first one is the CCP virus. Uh, we talked about this uh, some already. We'll get into uh, some more specifics here. And the first thing is to expose the lies. Expose the lies. And I've got a list of the lies here. Uh, immunity only comes from injections. Is that true? It is definitely not true. If you have contracted the virus and recovered, you have a way better immunity. Okay, that is the way to go. But they're pushing it. We don't care if you've had it, even if you've had it twice, you need to get this injection. Well, wait a minute, I already have natural immunity. We don't care, you're getting it. Little kids, their chance of even getting the virus is very, very small. Their chance of being seriously ill or dying is almost zero. But they've got to get injections. I don't think so. These are lies. And it's, gets, it gets into the transhumanism and all things we talked about before. This is what they're trying to do hurt people and, and, and these injections, they won't even tell us what's in them. So, no, that's a lie. Second, moral, mortality rates are reported sometimes is as high as 3.5% of people dying uh, from the virus, they get it. It's not even 1%. Now, by contrast, see that what they what, want to do is scare everybody. They want to instill fear so that you'll do whatever they tell you to. All right? I'll just ask you a real quick question. What is the mortality rate of smallpox? If we didn't have any medicine and people got smallpox, what would it be? It's, it's 30%. Basically, one out of every three people is not going to just get sick. They are going to die. Now that's what you call a serious illness, a serious problem. And how we should be thankful we have smallpox vaccines, right? That makes every common sense you can name. But when your mortality rate is less than 1% and you're trying to give everybody these injections that haven't been tested, they're not even a true vaccine, uh, I don't think so. This is, a, and they're lying, even at the 3.5%. Another, inflated body counts, because lots of times, and I think you all know this, they're saying it's 900,000 or something Americans have died, but I know personally, I know of a man who, he, I knew him fairly well, um, and he got some extra money and went out and bought a bunch of drugs, and got stoned and died. But when he gets to the hospital, they did some kind of test to say, well, he was positive COVID, so that's a COVID death because the hospital gets more money. And does anybody else know of an example like that? Oh yeah. People have car accidents and they write it up as a COVID death because they actually give money. So they're trying to fund, fund the inflated body counts, lies. Four, asymptomatic super spreaders. 
They, there's a lie out there that even though you don't have any, you, you're just as feeling as good as ever, no symptoms, nothing, but you're spreading the virus to other people. Actually, it's never been proven, not for one case, that that happens. And this is like the kids. Again, this is why they, they have to have the mask and all this stuff because it'll give grandma the, the virus. Not true. Five, no safe, affordable treatment. Well, I already went over that. Uh, yes, there is. Um, there, there's hydroxychloroquine, and now this, this chlorine dioxide, they say, is fantastic. And ivermectin. If you use them early on especially, you won't get sick. And uh, I know lots of personal cases where this has proven true. Yes? I don't, I don't know if you need a prescription. I think you can actually make it. You can get them the raw ingredients over the counter and order from Amazon and things like that. Right, right. And by the way, in case you don't know, New Hampshire's trying to pass a bill now that will make ivermectin available over the counter. So they, yeah, it is, it is late. But who knows? There could be another surge or something like this, you know. So it's, it's good to know about. And you can have your own little stockpile. I actually have a stockpile of this stuff, just in case somebody in my family um, gets sick. All right, so expose the lies. Secondly, understand biowarfare. Um, I already said this, was, this virus was produced in a, the Wuhan lab, which was used for biological warfare. And so you need to understand that and what's behind it. Then beware the injections. Um, I'm, again, if somebody wants to get the injection, hey, go for it, you know. I, I'm not going to try to stop them. But don't try to make me get it. And so we need to oppose these passports, stop, uh, and the mandates. So there's actually a website, stopvaxpassports.org. Uh, you can see this and uh, you get lots of good information about that and why that's a bad way uh, to go. These mandates, of course the truckers and everybody, they're, they're out there uh, raising awareness of it. And the, the passports especially are bad because they're a way of tracking your medical information. It's the, it's the, the camel toe in the door there uh, under the tent to make, a, again, it goes back to that transhumanism and they want to have uh, surveillance of you and all of your medical history. So if they don't like you, they can get rid of you. And that's why we need to stop this before it even gets started. It's a gateway to mass surveillance. Like, di yeah, digital currency is a financial counterpart to this. I think maybe we'll come to that, but good point. Okay, seek treatment if infected. So, you know, if you, if you get the virus, don't sit there and wait. You need, you need to do something fast, if, if, especially if you know other people and you start to get symptoms right away. You need to get a hold of some of these effective remedies. Don't wait until you have to go to the hospital because then you're, you, they really got you. And um, so seek treatment if infected. Okay, any comments about the virus? Yes? I did have a comment about you can put in your living will that you do not want to ever be tested for COVID. Wow. And they cannot test you for it. Um, okay. I was about it on Thursday. She's like, well, why don't you want to be tested for it? Said, because I don't want you guys to say if I die today, that's what I die from. I see. So you can put that in your living will uh, that you don't want to be tested for it so you don't wind up like the person that died in a car accident. Yeah, they want to treat you with remdesivir, which costs $3,500 per course and does not work and is probably very dangerous. Lots of kidney failure. We, at the summit, you know, the, the, they had all the facts and figures on that. Something like 30% of the people have a kidney damage from taking that. A lot, a lot have died. 
But again, there's mislabeling, there's mistreatment, failure to treat early. All, all these things have gone into it. Uh, and, and a lot of the deaths in America are concentrated in certain places like New York City where they, they sent the people, the, the nursing home patients back into the nurse. After they get in the hospital, they find that they got COVID, they sent them back into the nursing homes. Well, that drove the numbers through the roof. And New Jersey is the same way. So there's certain pockets where it's very high, but then other places where it's very low. So we, you know, we stack, when you factor in those things, we stack up pretty well uh, worldwide. And it's not because of the vaccines either. Okay, um, now we're gonna go to another whole topic, climate alarmism uh, that we've touched on before, how they wanna use this to advance their agenda. So A, expose the lies. So what is some of the lies? The first lie is there's too much CO2 in the air. CO2 is not a pollutant and we don't have too much. So I want everybody, I think you got it in your notes there to memorize these figures here. If you took a, you know, just a, a glob of our uh, air and looked at it, um, analyzed it would be 78% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. Now knowing, so that, that's 98% are those two elements. That means 2% left for everything else and CO2 is, it's not one, I've had people guess, well maybe it's 1% or 10% or 1%. No, it's not even 0.1%, it's 0.04%. That's like a trace amount. And in spite of this, every plant on earth must have CO2. And you're telling me we got too much. No, we don't. So right away, that's a lie. This carbon footprint and all this stuff is a lie. If anybody's watching me on YouTube or something, I'm telling you right now, this is not science. This is nothing but lies. People that run plant, run plant nurseries will double the CO2. They, they get a big tent. I've seen them down in Florida. They have all these plants in there. They're growing them from, from seedlings to big plants that they can sell in the plant stores. They, they get a tent and they pump CO2 in there so that they double it. So it's 0.07, 0.08% carbon dioxide. The plants love it. They, they grow faster, they grow stronger, they don't get sick, no bugs can get them because they're so healthy. That is a fact. So we could double the CO2 on planet Earth and it would just make everything better. The plants will love it. So there is some signs of this happening too, that there is more CO2 and that the, there's greeting like central Australia and places like this, there's plants growing that haven't been there for like centuries. So um, we do not have too much CO2. Here's another lie. Global temperatures are at all time highs. No, they are not. Just looking at the history of the United States, go back to the 1930s, very few automobiles, very few, you know, um, engines running and things like this, but hot as can, can be and wipes out the farms in, in Oklahoma. The dust turns them into the dust bowl. So the people that wind up going to California and places like this because they can't even survive. That's how hot it was. And Washington DC is like 100 and some degrees. They're trying, and they didn't have air conditioning back then either. Um, and then another example would be globally the war medieval warming period. We know during the Renaissance temperatures hit unprecedented highs uh, over centuries. And, but, but human activity thrived. And of course there were no automobiles, there's no engines and things like that. They didn't even have the industrial revolution and things like that had not happened yet. So what's causing these changes in the temperatures? The sun. We are going around the sun and we have different angles and different distances from the sun. It varies just slightly, but it makes a huge difference in our temperatures. Um, and of course, it's a very delicate system to um, begin with. 
we can only exist in a very narrow range of temperatures. Um, and if, well, I'll go to the next thing. This is another lie. The temperatures are controlled by people. No, they're not controlled by people. They're controlled by the sun. And now there's an uh, organization, they have a nice website, you can look up called CFACT and you'll get much more of this. But um, just think about it, folks. What is the temperature, I'll say 100 miles north of here, I mean straight up into the sky. Do you know what the temperature is? <laughs> it's minus 450 degrees. It's almost absolute zero. And we're worried about global warming. It's, my, it's you know, everything is instantly frozen there. And that's not very far away. In fact, like 10 miles, it's like minus 40, 40 or something like that, at least all the time. Now, what happens if you go down, down through the, the soil about 10 miles? You know what the temperature is? It's 10,000 degrees. We don't know a lot about the composition down there because you can't send anything down there, it just melts, boom, it's, it's gone. Okay, 10,000 degrees and everything's molten down there. And here we are living in between those two extremes. How would you like it if it was averaging 20 degrees here in Vermont all year round? You'd leave, right? What if it averaged 100 degrees? You'd be out of here if you're someplace better to go, right? So we're in this narrow little range, temperature-wise, in terms of degrees, and yet we got these minus, we got plus 10,000 down there and minus 400 above us, and we got to live in this. We can't control it. What does it make you think of? In God we trust. Absolutely. He's, he's taking care of it. Otherwise, we're, we're either toast or we're ice. I don't know which one, but one, one way or another. Right, that's your happy choice, right. So temperatures are controlled by uh, people. Uh, th those are the three major lies there on climate alarmism. Uh, so we're going to expose the lies and then expose the Mar Marxist agenda behind climate uh, um, alarmism. You see, all of our enemies are laughing at the destruction of our economic health in pursuit of totally unattainable and unnecessary goals. China is building coal-fired plants like every month they're bringing a new one online. In China, coal. Meanwhile, oh, you can't do that here. That will create carbon. Well, wait a minute. What about the carbon that's coming from China already? Even from, you, there, we have some kind of wall around us that's going to stop the CO2 coming from China? No, we're not. And yet, oh, we can't do this. And we got to go to all electric cars. You talk about a joke, folks. Now, I'm an electrical engineer. I worked in the utility industry for 20 some years. We will not all be driving electric cars. Why? because there's not enough electricity. We're already, we already are straining our electric grid and our generation capacity to the breaking point, just running the lights and the computers and the things that we have now, heat and those things. You add cars in there, it was finished. It's gonna wipe it out. Plus, that is coming from coal and gas to begin with, Bob. There you go. Oh yeah. <laughs> build, build cables across the Pacific Ocean. Yes, Martha? Our, our Tesla cars have an agreement with China's company, and I'm sorry, I don't know my at the moment, I can't come up with the initials. But the company that makes the most uh, lithium batteries in the world is this company that they gave 10% ownership to Hunter Biden. Yeah. Guess what country has a huge, they not only make 90% of all the opium um, see, 
the opium product production in the world, but also the lithium. Guess what country? Sounds like Afghanistan to me. It is. It's Afghanistan. What do we right. think we're doing over Which there? Which just got taken over by China. You know, they have a border with China. Right. And, and, and is this a payback? Did Hunter get the... Hunter was given, gifted this. Hunter right. has a drug problem. And it's no. You know, what Hunter was given this. No strings attached. So now Biden feels like he's got... He, he needs to do a little payback here. So we'll gift them $85 billion in return and leaving all of our equipment over there. Right. Yeah, that's right. It's, it is all interrelated. Uh, so here's another thing. $30 trillion in debt now. And with this Green New Deal, if they, if they had their way, they'd drive us even farther. Well, it's becoming unsustainable. Because three, 30 trillion, you hear that, well, 30 trillion, what's the big deal? Well, that's $100,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. So if you say you're a family of four, you got two kids, that's $400,000 just for your family in debt. That's the legacy we're leaving to our children. And of course, they don't want it to go that far. They're trying to destroy us before that even happens. And this gets into this alternative currency and the reset and all the things that they're trying to, to do. Okay, so that's the exposing the Marxist agenda. Any comments about these things, the CPP virus or the climate alarmism? Yes. Oh, absolutely. In 2007, Al Gore made that movie. He said that by now, by 2022, there would be no snow in North America. You'd, your kids would only be able to read about it in storybooks and things like that. You could tell about it. And, and they had to take down the glaciers. In 2020, some of the glaciers out west, they had signs in from, by 2020, this glacier will no longer be here. Okay? Well, the glacier's still there, so they had to take the sign down. You know, that's, they're so wrong, and they, yet they can get, a, get away with being wrong and keep coming back with the same garbage message, teaching your children in school now the same thing, even though it's been proven over and over and over to be totally false. We are losing our glaciers, and the sea level is rising. It is not rising. We're losing glaciers some places and adding them other places. You know, again, 2007, Al Gore said that by now the ocean will be up like 10 feet or something. So what's he do? He buys a mansion in San Diego, California, right on the coast. He doesn't even believe it himself. We're talking about, you know, millimeters in, in rising of, of the, the tides. It's insignificant. And this is a totally false Marxist agenda. All right, let's go on to another favorite topic here. That's the 2020 election steal. Now, over and over, I know some of you, you've got family members, they'll tell you, well, there's no evidence for that that's because that's been beat into their heads. All the mainstream news, and, no, that's just a lie. Just Trump made this up. It's a lie. There's no evidence. That is a lie. Here's some evidence. It's more than this now. This is July last year. They had 5,000 sworn affidavits. Now, if you're, we got at least one lawyer here, Tom. Is a sworn affidavit evidence? Absolutely. Somebody is risking their reputation. They're signing this, saying this happened. If you can prove it didn't happen, guess what? They're in big trouble, right, Tom? Yes. They've committed perjury or something like that? Right, so that's why a sworn affidavit is evidence, and we have 5,000. They're election officials, some of them were contractors for the companies that made the election machines, and some of them were poll watchers and poll workers. And they've come forward and said, you know, the stuff I saw there was not right. 5,000, that's just to begin with. Then we have impossible stats. Again, if you go to frankspeech.com, you will see this, impossible things like voter turnout that matches the profiles of a census. You can, and they use, here's the thing, they use the 2010 census. 
so that the voter turnouts match the 2010 census. But what they didn't notice some, or didn't count on, people went back and they checked against the 2020 census and found out there weren't even that many people in a place where you, you had more votes than there are people. Okay, in lots of ca cases of this. And, but even using the 2010 census, what you find out is the profiles match so completely that only computers could be generating the fake votes to fill them in. Now here's an example. This is Hamilton County, Ohio. He did this for every county in Ohio and many counties in the United States. So the black line, no, the, the top green line is the population based on the census. And the, the black line is registrations. And the red line is the ballots. What he found was, and, and then de going left to right is by age. So it starts at age 18 and goes out to age 110. Okay, that's the, the th you're seeing that, right? Oh, no. Oh, it's here. Okay, it's here. Um, you see how the curves match the shapes? And even, you see there's a little jut there to the right of the center. It go juts up, and they all jut up like that. You see, this can't happen by chance. This can't happen by naturally. It had to be computers generating the votes. And what happened was they were using conventional cheating methods, you know, trying to use phony ballots. We like the guys going around stuff in the ballot box. And they realized, hey, guess, guess what, guys? We're still losing, even though we did all that stuff. So then overnight, they went into gear on the computers and the computers filled in the gaps and they had to max out to try to pull the election out. Now just this curve, just one county getting this result in a natural way, unrigged way, would be the same as taking a 20-sided die and you roll that die 83 times and you get the result, the same result, say 15, 83 times. <laughs> totally impossible. The odds of that are like some, it's 50 zeros or something. You can't even roll twice in a row and get the same thing with the 20-sided die. But you'd have to do it 83 times in a row. That's the same probability of that county getting that result. And they're telling us we don't have any evidence. And you can do that for the, all the counties. It, it happened not just in the swing states like Arizona, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Georgia. But it's all the states they were doing this. Like Texas and Florida and California. They, they were using this everywhere. Okay, so that's another line of evidence. Just the impossible statistics. And here's a third thing, cyber forensic proof. And that means going back and looking at the, the internet records. It's like the cell phones. Every time you type something in your computer online, you know that's being stored somewhere. I mean, this is scary stuff. But the, they've got these gigantic databases. And so, again, they didn't anticipate this, but records were being made of transactions on the election night between Taiwan and China and the United States and Western Europe. So they, they can go back and look at it. And so thousands of international hacks on US election computers early on on November 4. And they've got it. So don't tell me that there is no evidence. There's overwhelming and it's increasing all the time evidence. Any comments? All right, I'm going to keep rolling here. We'll get done with this part uh, four. Hmm? Yeah, I've seen that, and it's just so frustrating that it hasn't been brought to the court in an effective way. Not only that, yeah, the courts won't hear it, but not only that, see, the conservative media will not talk about this. Like Fox, I, I mentioned Fox News and Newsmax.
Okay. Well, they need to roll. They need to roll this out. People need to see it.